The divergence theorem uh, attributed to, to Gauss, Gauss uh, was a, a mathematician back in the uh, 19th century, Carl Friedrich Gauss, he was one of the greatest, really one of the greatest. At the age of 20, he proved the fundamental theorem of algebra, um, which is not a, a, a trivial theorem. Okay? It, it, the, the proof uses uh, uh, complex analysis. Um, so this is the divergence theorem attributed to Gauss. It's sometimes also called, uh, attributed to a, to a Russian mathematician named Ostrogradsky. Ostrogradsky. Um, anyway, here's what the theorem says. So, so the data here is, uh, is a field, F, and we define the divergence of F to be this, uh, this expression which involves the partial derivatives. And here's the theorem. Gauss's theorem. So let S, S is going to be a surface, B, uh, closed, piecewise, smooth, surface, which is the boundary of uh, V. That's the solid for which S is the boundary. Closed means that it's a closed surface, like a, uh, uh, a sphere is a closed surface, which is the boundary of a ball, okay, for example. And piecewise smooth means that it doesn't have to be smooth everywhere, but it, it could be not smooth along uh, a finite number of points, or we also allow uh, a f uh, uh, being, uh, allowing it to be not smooth along curves, along one dimension lower uh, um, uh, uh, I'm missing a word. Al along one dimension lower. So a surface a piecewise surf surface, for example, is a box. A box is a piecewise sm smooth surface, okay? Because it's not smooth along lines, okay? So S is a closed piecewise smooth surface, which is the boundary of some domain V, and with normal uh, with the normal pointing outwards at every point. So at every point, the normal is directed to, towards the outside of, of V, of the surface S. And the field, uh, let F, which is the field PQR, be in C1. In general, all that we need is it for it to be C1 on V, uh, on a domain, on a region containing V. Containing V. Then, and here comes the formula of Gauss's theorem. So the, the theorem is everything that precedes it as well, but the formula, which is usually what we remember and use, is the surface integral, the surface integral over S of the field F dot dS. So this is the surface integral over S and since S is a closed surface, we often add this closed circle on both snakes. This is to indicate that we're looking at a closed surface. Closed surface. Equals 
the triple integral over the solid, the inside, the domain V, of the divergence of F dx dy dz. This is Gauss's theorem. And our intuitive discussion of the meaning of the diverg uh, divergence in the previous clip should convince you that this makes sense. Why? On the right-hand side, by our previous discussion, we're measuring the flux coming out of V, coming out of the surface area of V. This is what we're measuring, because we're taking the divergence and integrating it over the entire region. On the left-hand side, by definition, we're measuring the flux coming out of S. That's what a surface integral is, the flux coming out of S. And since the normal is pointing outwards, that's precisely this thing. Okay? And Gauss's theorem says that these are indeed two ways of looking at the same thing. They're equal. Okay? So I'm not going to add a formal proof of Gauss's theorem, but the idea should be, should be accepted, should, should make sense. This is this theorem. I want to point out a couple remarks, and then we're going to do some, some um, uh, examples. So the first remark is, the first remark is, we're looking at, we're looking at a solid V with a boundary, which is the surface S. When is this flux zero? Can it be that both sides, since they're the same, are zero? That would mean that there's no flux coming out of the surface. That would be the situation when you just take a surface and put it in, for example, uh, uh, a water, a stream, a, a, a river. Take a river, take a, a, any surface you want, a box, a ball, whatever, put it in the river. Suppose it's made out of net so the water can go in and come out, so it's a ball made, of a, made out of a net, you put it in the river, what's going to be the flux coming out of the ball? No. L look at it here. Here's the ball. It's made of, of a net. It's inside the river. There's water coming in and there's water coming out. The total water coming out is the water coming out of this side minus the water coming in of this side, because water coming in is minus water coming out. So the total water coming out is zero. Whatever goes in goes out. There's no flux through the entire surface. If you just look at this side, there is flux. If you just look at this side, there's negative flux. If you add them, there's no flux. Is that clear? Okay. So that would lead maybe to a question, how could there be flux? out of a closed surface. How could there ever be flux when you're taking a closed surface? Isn't it always zero, stuff coming in, coming out the other side? How could it ever be non-zero? So the answer is, it can be non-zero if there's a source of the field inside the solid. So if, for example, there's some uh, spring of water inside your 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 the object that you put, okay, then there's more water coming out than water going in. So then there would be positive flux. And indeed, indeed, a field, a field that has positive flux in specific regions is, is said to have sources in those regions. That's the, 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 the professional word, sources. Okay? And a field that has no sources, that the flux is zero on every domain, is called a field without sources. Okay? It doesn't have to be water, it can be any field, but the word sources is still used. And flux can be negative, there would be more flux going in than flux coming out, if there's a sink inside your, your, your solid, inside V. Okay? If, for example, if you think of your, uh, uh, if you think of the river and then there's a little, uh, like in your bathtub, a little sink there, then water going in, flowing in from the river, some of it would not come out because it's 
vanishing into that sink. Okay, so if there's negative flux for a closed surface, it means there's a sink there. If there's positive flux from a closed surface, it means there's a source there. And if there's no so sources and no sinks, then the flux is going to be zero. Okay, so this is another important thing about the notion of flux out of a closed surface. Another um, remark that I want to mention, this theorem is of the general form, this is not a very precise statement, but it, 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 it hints to a precise statement, which we're not able to say yet, but it's of the form, it should remind you of Green's theorem or of, the, of Newton-Leibniz formula. On this side, you're taking two snakes, a double integral, over the boundary of a region, S is the boundary of V, right? So you're taking a double integral of F over the boundary. This equals to the triple integral, not over the boundary, but over the in, in, entire inside, but not of the field if, itself, but rather some form of derivative of the field, in this case, the divergence. Let's recall Green's theorem. It's still here on this board. So Green's theorem said, take a region in two dimensions, a, a planar region, D, look at its boundary gamma, integrate the field over the boundary gamma, it's the same as integrating over the entire region, which gamma is the boundary of, but not of the field of some expression involving derivatives of the field. Okay? And as we mentioned, this is again an analogy to the Newton-Leibniz formula. The integral of a function equals the function evaluated at A minus the function evaluated at B at the endpoints of the domain, but you take the, the derivative, okay? So all these theorems, as well as Stokes' theorem, which is the next theorem we're going to discuss, are along the same line, okay? They're uh, uh, interchanging, okay? Adding an integral, adding a snake, at the price of taking the derivative of the function you're integrating, in this case, a field. Adding a snake, going up snake-wise, going down derivative-wise, and the up and down in terms of the snakes is boundary versus the entire region. This is Green's theorem. Let's look back again at Gauss. Adding a snake, going from the boundary to the entire region at the price of going from the function, in this case the field, to some expression, some derivative of the function. Okay, is this, is this clear? Do you see the analogy? Do you see that these three theorems, the Newton-Leibniz formula from Calc 1, Green's theorem, and Gauss's theorem, are in essence very similar? Okay, Stokes is going to be as well. They're all particular cases of one, I, I think I mentioned that, of one theorem, uh, more general theorem in differential um, geometry. Okay, so let's do an example. So here's an example of using Gauss's theorem. Um, so we need a field and we need a surface. So the field F of x, y, z is going to be 4x in the i direction plus, or sorry, minus minus 2y squared in the j direction plus z squared in the k direction. No, it's not a mistake. It's the same field we used in the example we had for calculating uh, um, a surface integral. And in fact, we're going to use the same surface and we're going to calculate the same surface integral, but instead of calculating, di calculating it directly like we did uh, in the previous clip, or a couple of clips ago, now we're going to calculate it using Gauss's theorem and hopefully get the same answer. So this is the field, and the surface, the surface, S, is uh, the cylinder the cylinder 
x squared plus y squared equals 4, um, z between 0 and 3, including both caps, the top and the bottom. Okay, so S is distinct. This is z, y, x, and here it's 3, 2, and 2, okay? So, again, I'm reminding you, if you don't remember, look a couple of clips back. We calculated the flux going out of this closed surface using just the definition of the surface integral for a field, okay? We broke the surface into three uh, surfaces, the, the, the cylinder itself and the two caps, and calculated each one separately, added them up. Our answer, our final uh, answer was 84 pi, okay? So now I want to do it using Gauss's theorem. So let's find the flux of F going out of S this is S using Gauss's theorem. So the first thing we have to do so there's the formula. We can right away jump in on the formula, but it's a theorem. And we know that in mathematics, when we want to use a theorem, we first have to verify that the conditions of the theorem hold. So let's look at the theorem again. S has to be a closed piecewise smooth surface, which is the boundary of some domain V, normal pointing outwards, and the field has to be C1 on a region containing V. Then the formula holds. So let's check if all that is true, and it is. S is a closed surface. It's, it's the entire can, the closed surface. Um, please look here on this board, thanks. S is the closed surface. Um, the normal is pointing outwards. That's, that's hinted in saying we're looking at the flux going out of S. So that's what we did in the, when we calculated this example previously as well. Um, it's piecewise smooth because it's comprised of three smooth surfaces. It's a disjoint, a, 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 a union of three smooth surfaces. The top, the bottom, and the sides. So it's piecewise smooth. And the field, here's the field. This is C1. This is a C1 field because all of P, Q, and R, P, Q, and R, are all C1 functions of three variables on all of R3. So it's a C1 uh, field. So the conditions of Gauss's theorem hold, all of them. So by Gauss's theorem, by Gauss's theorem, the flux going out of the surface, that's what we're interested in, the flux going out of the surface, the closed surface, S, of this field, dot ds equals the triple integral, the triple integral over the domain v, which is now the solid, let me indicate it by drawing it again here and filling all of it up. Okay, so this is v, the inside the solid, which is that uh, can here, so that's V, of the divergence of the field. That's what we need to put here, dx, dy, dz. What's the divergence of this field? So let's calculate it. Okay, so here we need the divergence of the field. Let's calculate it. 
Um, I don't want to erase anything. Let's see if we have space here. Or let's, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll erase this. So we know what S is. So let's write it here. The divergence of F, which is what we need to plug into the triple integral if we want to use Gauss's theorem, not F itself, is what? Is the derivative of P, the derivative of P with respect to X, plus the derivative of Q with respect to Y, plus the derivative of R with respect to Z, and in this case, it's very easy to calculate. Well, it's always easy to calculate. It's just taking partials. So the derivative of p with respect to x is 4 plus. The derivative of q with respect to y, it's going to be a minus, is 4y. And the derivative of r with respect to z is 2z. This is the divergence of this field f. Good? Clear? Remember that in general, these are functions of three variables each, and you're only looking at one partial for each of them. Okay, so this is what I'm going to put in here, 4 minus 4y plus 2z. dx, dy, dz. This is what Gauss's theorem tells us. This is what we want to calculate now. Good? Now, do I need to parameterize anything? Remember, the, the way we solved it previously, we calculated this by going through the definition of a surface integral. Let me remind you, this was the definition of a surface integral, and the first thing it required was a parametrization of the surface. Right? Remember all this? Okay, so th there's a lot of material that has accumulated. We're at the very end of the of the course. So this is a surface integral of a vector field and it's defined by taking the field, dotting it with a normal, using a parametrization. Okay. Do we need to parametrize anything when we're doing this? The answer is no. Okay. This is just a good old triple integral. Triple integral, we know how to calculate it providing it's a simple domain. Okay. So providing we can write it in terms of iterated integrals, and that's what we're going to do. So S is a simple domain. It's, it's this disk down here, and the, the, the Z's range between 0 and 3, right? So this is a straightforward calculation um, of a triple integral. Let's do it. It's very easy. Um, so let's erase this. Let's erase everything. Can, can, be, before I erase this board, because I want to keep it all on the same board, is it clear so far? Can I continue from here? I want to erase all of this. Everybody good? Okay. So this equals, this equals... How can I express, how can I express the, this triple integral in terms of iterated integrals? You can do it in x and y, or th since this is a cylinder, it really calls for doing a change of variables, not a parametrization, a change of variables from x, y, z to rho, phi, z. Okay, so we're going to do a change of variables. And this is confusing. It's confusing that the, the notions of changing variables and doing a parametrization are sometimes confusing. Okay, so now we're just doing a triple integral. It's given as uh, an integral over v dx dy dz. We want to change variables. So x equals, uh, what letters did I use? Rho and phi, rho cosine phi y equals rho sine phi, and z equals z. This is changing variables, changing variables 
from x, y, z to rho phi z to cylindrical coordinates. So what do we get? We get, so our region S, the region S, goes from what to what? So Z goes from 0 to 3. This is DZ of um, theta goes from, or phi goes from 0 to 2 pi. 0 to 2 pi d phi of, and then rho goes from 0 to, this was x squared plus y squared equals 4, so it goes from 0 to 2, d rho. Good? And now I need, I'm going to move these a bit, so this was uh, d, I'm going to move it even a bit more, d rho, d phi, d z. Okay, so it's not parametrizing. It's not just the surface. It's changing variables of the entire x, y, z plane to the entire rho phi z plane. And looking what happens to v becomes the w, and w is bounded by these uh, values of uh, rho phi and z. And now what do I need inside? I need to change variables here, so I have 4 minus 4y, so 4 rho sine phi, plus 2z. So this is the function after changing variables. And what else do I need when I do changing variables? Right, I need the Jacobian. The Jacobian of changing to, 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 to cylindrical coordinates, do you remember? Right, it was just rho. So I need rho here, and this is g. Okay, and this is the integral that I have to evaluate. Let's do it quickly. So, oh, let's erase this and erase this. This is j. And let's see what we get. So let's do it step by step. Integral from 0 to 3. What, what, what is completely independent here? No, there's a bit of everything, right? OK. So it's the integral from 0 to 3 dz of the integral from 0 to 2 pi d phi of, and now I'm going to do the integral d rho. So I have 4 times rho, which becomes 4 rho squared divided by 2. Let's write it like this. 4, sorry, 4 rho is 4 rho squared divided by 2 minus 4 rho squared sine phi so it's going to be 4 rho cubed over 3 sine phi plus 2z rho, so plus 2z rho squared divided by 2. And all of this evaluated between rho equals 0 and rho equals 2. Right? What did I do? This closes that. There's one extra. Right? So let's calculate what we get. So when we plug in the zeros for rho, everything dies. When we plug in a 2, so we get the integral from 0 to 3 of the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And what do we get here? 2 squared is 4 divided by 2 is 2 times 4 is 8 minus 2 cubed is 8 times 4 is 32 over 3 sine phi plus 
2 squared is 4 times 2 is 8 divided by 2 is 4 z. d phi dz. There should be no rows that have survived this step. Okay, now let's do the, the phi part. Um, this thing is going to die when we do the integral d phi because, because there's a sine phi here and we're going to evaluate it between 0 and 2 pi. So the antiderivative is going to be a cosine and at 2 pi and 0 they're the same value. So this part of it is 0. I don't need to calculate it. So what do I get? The integral d phi and this doesn't have any phi's in it, right? So the integral d phi is just going to introduce 2 pi. I can write it here. 2 pi, that's the integral d phi because there's no phi's here. And then I have the integral from 0 to 3 of 8 plus 4z dz. Do you agree? And this equals 2 pi um, 8z plus 4z squared over 2 evaluated between 0 and 3. At 0, I get nothing. At 3, I get 24. So it's 2 pi times 24 plus z squared is 9. 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18. And that's it. So 24 plus 18 is what? is 38, 42 times 2 pi, 84 pi. Whew. Okay, we got the same thing that we got when we evaluated this using the, um, the definition of a surface integral of a vector field. Questions? Okay, so the, 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 once you get here, it's again a triple integral, a triple integral, if you know how to take the first step in writing it as iterated integrals, you're back in Calc 1. And the Calc 1 calculations are usually not too complicated. In this case, everything was very straightforward, very direct. Sometimes you still need to use some, uh, uh, maybe uh, integrating by parts or substitution or rational functions or whatnot. In this example, there was nothing. It was just straightforward calculations. Questions on this? Okay, so Gauss's theorem, which we have here, first of all, we have to remember, remember that it's a theorem. It has conditions and you always have to verify it, verify them before you apply Gauss's theorem. Tells you, if you have a closed surface, only for a closed surface, evaluating the surface integral of a vector field, calculating, finding the flux coming out of the surface, is the same as evaluating the triple integral over the solid for which the surface is a boundary of the divergence. Okay? What we're going to see in, in further examples, that, that's going to be in the coming clips, what we're going to see is that this thing, by, by the statement of the theorem, can only be applied to closed surfaces. And in many instances, we want to find we want to find the flux uh, on an open surface. Here's an open surface, okay? Not a closed surface, an open surface. And what we often do, and we'll see that in examples, we take the open surface and close it in a convenient way. Once we close it, we can use Gauss's theorem, and then we need to subtract the flux from the part we closed it with. So if you have a very complicated surface and you close it with a nice disk, for example, then calculating the flux through the disk is easy and you subtract that from calculating the triple integral over the divergence. Where if this turns out to be an easier calculation than parameterizing the surface and doing this, 
then it pays off. Okay, we'll see that in examples. Um, so any questions about Gauss's theorem and the example that we did? Everybody good? Okay, so um, maybe one more comment. We'll also see an example. So, so using this is only useful when the divergence is, is, is user-friendly. Okay? And we'll see that many, many times the F itself can be ugly, even very ugly, whereas the divergence is very simple and user-friendly. And the reason is that F can, can, have, can be big, and in the divergence we're not looking at all of F, we're only taking the partial of P with respect to X, and we're only taking the partial of Q with respect to Y, and we're only taking the partial of R with respect to Z. So this pays off whenever this is easier to calculate, that usually depends on how user-friendly is the divergence. In the cases where the divergence is simpler to handle than the field itself, and the solid is easy to, to, to write as an iterated integral, easier than, than parameterizing the surface, then it pays off. And we'll see examples of both. Sometimes we'll use this, sometimes we'll use Gauss's theorem. Okay, we'll see more examples. I'm just doing uh, promos to examples which I haven't show you, shown you, so those will come up in the following clips.